Good morning. morning. Who's alive in here? (laughs) Um, That would be all of us. It is awesome to be here. Thank you so much for allowing me to share a little bit of our passion, what we do through the Radiance Foundation. Uh, I'm talking about this, planned propaganda. So there's a lot of stuff to cover. You know, you need a whole week-long conference to dig deeply into these issues, but we've got a few minutes. So I just want to give you a little background into who we are, what we do. The Radiance Foundation is a nonprofit organization that loves to creatively illuminate that life is purpose. And so we have a lot of original content, videos, memes, fact sheets, all kinds of things. Uh, Our research we call fearless factivism. And so we get to go around the world, and it's amazing when God calls you to do something and you step out and do it. And it seems crazy, but then again, when you're pro-life, when you're a Christian, sometimes you just do crazy things. Amen? Amen. Anybody here ever do a crazy thing? Okay. So you know, my wife was a teacher for 13 years. I worked as a creative director for the same amount of time, and we wanted to tackle tough issues. And so she left her full-time job. I left my full-time job. In 2009, when the economy was not booming, and so it was a crazy thing, but it's amazing where God has taken us. These are some of the topics that we get to address. And we love creating content to equip people to talk about tough things. One of the things that I'm gonna just mention here, I'm gonna brag about my wife for just a moment. My favorite person on the planet, who's also now my favorite children's author. She just wrote the new Pro-Life Kids book because we hear all the time in our travels, how do I talk to my young children about abortion? And it's too late to wait until they're teens. The world is bombarding our children with all kinds of issues, but from a broken perspective. Why aren't we teaching our children the truth? Because they're naturally pro-life. They actually have to be misled to believe that it's somehow okay to kill an unborn child. And so this is an age-appropriate way to talk about how life has purpose, to talk about the issue of abortion. And then, of course, as a result of my surreal lawsuit with the NAACP. I was sued for parroting their name and calling out their radical pro-abortion actions. I wrote an article entitled The National Association for the Abortion of Colored People. (laughs) They, They did not like it, but I didn't like the fact that an organization that I grew up revering uh, was on the wrong side of things. They actively partner with Planned Parenthood. They are radically pro-abortion. So they sued me in federal court. They lost. Two years, we were represented by (laughs) Alliance Defending Freedom represented us. They protected our civil rights against a civil rights organization. I mean, it's just crazy. See, I'm a factivist, and I am passionate about the issues. The problem so many Christians have, and, and I laud those who, who act out of the sense of injustice, but we cannot simply act out of emotion. Because emotion lead, leads us to some dangerous consequences. So I'm all about factivism. This video kind of explains the difference between an activist and a factivist. When a woman gets pregnant, that is not a human being inside of her. <laughs> We know it's a living human being that's inside of her. I mean, you wouldn't think that you'd be arguing that today, but I remember last year when I was at, on NPR and I was having a debate with, the, with Kojo and he was arguing the same thing. We don't know that that's human. What? How do, and I just found it really ironic that another African American was somehow saying that another group of human beings is not human. And I said, we've already been through this before. And he said, no, we haven't. I said, it's called slavery. <laughs> he didn't agree with me. That's okay. But to understand why I am so passionate about this issue is to know a little better my backstory. I was adopted into a tiny family of 15. I have <laughs> six brothers and six sisters. In fact, this is the The first moment that my mom was able to hold me, I was six weeks old. I know, cute, right? (laughs) Six weeks old, and it's really amazing because my parents are often asked, well, what influenced you, what motivated you to adopt? And sometimes you can kind of hear the the undertone to the questions of what possessed you to adopt (laughs) 10 children. (sighs) Brokenness and love. See, my mom had an alcoholic father and her parents were separating. Her father was abusive, uh, emotionally and psychologically abusive. 
And so my mom was placed in a children's home for one year. And during that, that time, at the age of five, it's when my mom got the heart for adoption. She just remembers seeing another little girl who had physical disabilities. No one came to visit her, but at least my mom had her mom and her dad visit her separately. But this little girl, nobody. And so my mom remembers getting down on her knees one night and just praying to God, God, please help me be a mommy to those who don't have one. And so that heart was shared by my dad because you kind of have to be on the same wavelength if you're going to adopt 10 kids. And so it started here. This is when we were still a small family of eight. But I love this. My, my parents didn't do interviews often, but I love that the journalist actually got it. You see in the title, quote, unwanted children, unquote, find their wanted. See, there's no such thing as an unwanted child. I mean, some of us may have been unwanted by a biological parent or parents, but we're all wanted by someone. And we were absolutely wanted by Henry and Andrea Bomberger, who had no idea what they're getting into. By the way, you don't have to adopt 10 kids to not know what you're getting into. You can have one child <laughs> who's biologically related and you still question whose child that is. But anyway, they didn't know what they were getting into. They just knew what they were called to do. And so here's our whole family, all 15 of us. You can tell we obviously look alike, right? <laughs> We're white and we're black, white and black, Native American, Vietnamese, mixed. Two of my brothers are albino. We have some physical disabilities, some learning disabilities in our family. Every one of us love like crazy. Even special needs in our family. In fact, everyone in this room has special needs, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and that is to love and to be loved. And my experience growing up in this diverse family, I know we don't hear the word diversity much, right? Okay, all the time. And diversity is wonderful. God created diversity, but commonality is also powerful, like those special needs that we all have to love and to be loved. And growing up in a family like this, one of the most powerful lessons that I learned is this, and this is one of the foundational tenets of the Radiance Foundation. We are one human race. Can I get an amen in here? Amen. Whew, we are so, I, I know people mean well when they say we should be a colorblind society. No, we shouldn't. God created color for us to celebrate each other, not to separate each other. So I love the fact that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm brown, I don't know if you noticed that, but I love the fact that being white and black, my passion is really to be a bridge and to be a reconciler because we are created from one blood. And I want to show you now this picture when people talk about unwanted and unwanted child. I don't know what image you may have in your mind, but hopefully you will replace whatever that image is with this next image. This is what unwanted looks like. It's my family, it's just my brothers, my sisters, their spouses, their children, no, no extended family. Actually, there's one little grandma in the middle of the picture, but it's just my immediate family. And so this is what unwanted looks like. Wow. So this is 62 of us, and this is actually missing 13 people. Oh. This was done three years ago, and the family keeps growing through adoption, through marriage. But see, this is what happens when you defy the world's low expectations. It's amazing what happens when you love. And this picture is made possible because many birth moms chose to be stronger than their circumstances. I mean, God wires us that way. I'm a firm believer in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through who strengthens me. Whether you're a woman or a man, we can rise above all the time, not on our own strength. I've never met my birth mom. I searched for her years ago, and the search came up negative. So I never actually connected. But over the years, as a creative, I try to figure out, well, how do I even thank this woman that I've never met? How do I, what do I even say? What words are even sufficient? And so I, I wrote a song called Meant to Be. And then I also created this video that showed all the things that I've been able to become in my life by the grace of God, all because of her singular decision. It's really amazing. We don't often think about the impact of a singular decision, but our singular decisions have reverberations for generations. And hers definitely have, has had reverberations for generations. If I never meet her face to face, this is kind of the conversation that I would want to have. So I created this video, wrote this, this song, just as a tribute to her, and maybe, maybe she'll see it on social media, I don't know, or maybe one day I'll be able to say these words to her. Gave my life a 
Truth never gets old. <laughs> I'm that 1% that's used 100% of the time to justify abortion. And yet, mm, my life has just as much value as anyone else. Psalm 139 doesn't have an asterisk that says, oh wait, <laughs> if you were humanly planned. Most of us are unplanned. I mean, if you're a parent, we all know you can plan all you want and most of the time it doesn't work out quite that way. I will say that the reverberations are beautiful and I just... I know she's gonna be embarrassed by this, but I want one of the most beautiful reverberations to stand up. It's my daughter, Ray Ray. Radiance, the reason for the name of our organization. She's in the back there. Love you, kiddo. Whew. See, but the abortion industry and Planned Parenthood in particular is predicated on this lie. Unplanned equals unwanted equals unloved. In fact, they call themselves a pro-choice organization or people tout them as a pro-choice organization, but this is what they have to say about adoption. They say that the psychological responses to abortion are far less serious than those experienced by women bringing their unwanted pregnancy to term and relinquishing the child for adoption. I mean, if you're demonizing one of the only two alternatives to the violence of abortion, are you really pro-choice? I mean, of course, it's amazing what we do with euphemisms, like made. I mean, we try to lessen how inhumane our actions are. But Planned Parenthood explains why they abort 81 human beings for every one adoption referral. This is who and what they are. They, they've demonized life and they've demonized pregnancy since their beginnings. Um, the brokenness of Margaret Sanger, unfortunately she, she lived a life of brokenness, also had an alcoholic father, and she never rose above her brokenness. The way that she perceived or looked at humanity was that Certain humans needed to be eliminated. Instead of eliminating the problems that caused the brokenness, she wanted to eliminate the human beings. In fact, this is how she defined birth control in her book, Women in the New Race, Chapter 18, so you can understand the DNA of Planned Parenthood. She says, birth control itself often denounced as a violation of natural law, is nothing more or less than the facilitation of the process of weeding out the unfit, of preventing the birth of defectives, or of those who will become Defectives. Doesn't that sound like women's empowerment to you? I mean, she's the mother of the birth control crusade, right? I want to play you a clip just so you can understand the heart of Margaret Sanger from her own mouth, because out of the heart, what? The mouth speaks, right? So this is her being interviewed by Mike Wallace. In fact, I encourage you to watch the whole interview. It's brilliant. It's from 1957. If you go to the Harry Ransom Center online, you can see the whole video. But just listen to this clip where she's asked if she believes in sin, and this is her response. Do you believe in sin? When I say believe, I don't mean and believe in committing sin. Do you believe there is such a thing as, a, as sin? Well, I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being, practically. Delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just mock when they're born. That, to me, is the greatest sin. She had powers of ESP, I guess you could tell what someone was become. I mean, most of us don't even know what we're going to be five years from now. I mean, some of us are redefining ourselves all the time. I mean, we don't know. And yet, this is the, the basis for which they decided that certain human beings weren't fit to live. And so this is the DNA of Planned Parenthood, which, of course, gets all of its support from mainstream media, public education, Hollywood, the, the entertainment industry. I mean, they reinforce these lies all the time. In fact, I want to give you a perfect example of the fake news that Planned Parenthood puts out there. Uh, if you remember the Center for Medical Progress, 
Remember the expose videos on Planned Parenthood trafficking in unwanted babies, wanted aborted body parts, right? Do you remember what happened online with Planned Parenthood's website and what mainstream media reported? Just days after the expose, they reported Planned Parenthood's website was attacked. It was hacked by pro-life extremists because we have nothing better to do with our time than to hack into websites. But anyway, this is what you saw when you went to Planned Parenthood's website. Our site is not available due to an attack by extremists. If your website's been attacked by extremists, um, it doesn't typically say it's been attacked by extremists, nor does it give you the option, if you see down the bottom there, send a, dona send a donation. <laughs> Fake health. This is what Planned Parenthood is. You have to ask yourself, what real healthcare organization pretends to have its website hacked? Planned Parenthood, of course, it was re revealed just about a week and a week and a half later by conservative and pro-life sources that it was a new PR campaign. It was for them to be able to upload all this new content. It was completely fake. Mainstream media didn't report that it was fake then, but this is what happened. So you have to ask yourself, what real women's healthcare organization pretends to have its website hacked? But you'd understand that if you know this quote from the New York Times, Cecile Richards, the former president, who said, we aim to be the largest kick butt political organization. See, when you're political, you will pretty much do whatever it takes. I mean, when you think politics, does anybody here think honesty? <laughs> I mean, we want our politicians to be honest, but really, they'll do whatever, and Planned Parenthood does whatever. They don't aim to be a kick-butt ethical organization, which a lot of our pro-life organizations, I mean, that's what we are, transformational organizations. That's what we focus on. I want to give you another example. I was shocked when I saw this from the Washington Post. They actually called out the former, <laughs> the other former Planned Parenthood president, Dr. Lena Wen, who said that thousands of women died each year before Roe, and Washington Post actually called them out. But they still use this lie. They still tout this lie, even though Planned Parenthood debunked its own lie back in 1959. If you go to our, our article, it's radiance.life slash hangers, You'll see there's a quote from Dr. Mary Calderon, who was Planned Parenthood's medical director, and she said, in 1957, there were only 260 deaths in the whole country attributed to abortions of any kind. Call them what you will, abortionists or anything else, they are still physicians. They must do a pretty good job if the death rate is as low as it is. So Planned Parenthood debunked its own hangers myth decades ago, and they still tout the same lie. This is why... I, they're just the epitome of fake feminism. And so in our organization, the Radiance Foundation, we pull our kids in whenever we can because we want them to use their God-given talents in, in any way that they can. And so my youngest daughter joined me because my, I want my, my girls to understand what real feminism is, what true feminism is, and that is accepting that they are beautifully biologically different and yet they're still equal. They don't have to, they don't have to deny who they are, and they're, they're beautiful. And my, my girls don't have to hate on boys. I have two girls, two boys. They don't have to hate on boys in order to, to feel empowered, that I love them equally. And so my, my youngest daughter, Aaliyah, joined me in this little uh, video that kind of just talks about Planned Parenthood's fake feminism. They love to tell ya, abortion's all good for ya. Just pay a fee and get equality. Their lies defenseless But parenthood's been counting for a century It's fake feminism It's fake feminism It's fake feminism They don't want you to know It's fake feminism It's fake feminism It's fake feminism All they want is your doubt this is basic health care. Thousands of women die before Roe every year. We're not political. Planned Parenthood, we're not partisan. Planned Parenthood is fake feminism. Fake feminism. Fake feminism. They don't want you to know. Fake feminism. Fake feminism. Fake feminism. All they want is your doubt. There is actually a video to it. I'm not sure why it's not playing, but um. <laughs> They are fake feminism. And if you go to radiance.life, you can see the video. But I, I love that my, my girls can help me out in some of these projects. But we have this, this new fact sheet. It's called Planned Parenthood Provides Less Care No Matter What. People are always talking about abortions only 3% of their services. But look at all the other services they provide. Well, 
No seeming amount of beneficence makes up for the fact that you're killing human beings 3% of the time. I don't care if it's 0.00003% of the time. It'd be like your local bank saying, yes, um, 3% of the people who walk through our doors, we do kill them, but we give great investment options to uh, everybody else. What? So, <laughs> this fact, she shows you that in the last 10 years, every, nearly every ma major medical service to women has been plummeting. Breast cancer screenings are down 68%. Pap tests are down 72%. Prenatal services down 76%. This is just since 2009. But you know what isn't down? Abortion has increased 4% in the last 10 years. And here's what's even worse. Oh my goodness, profits have increased 600%. 600% at Planned Parenthood. And of course, their taxpayer funding increased from 487 million to 617. It's about a $130 million increase. We've got a lot of work to do. Because the, in the end, Planned Parenthood is fake health. They are touting fake health. They are putting women's lives in danger. Of course, they are killing precious, innocent human beings. In their last report, 345,000. There's got to be more that we can do. The church cannot be silent. You know, Planned Parenthood used to actually have this business model. This is from a brochure from the um, late 30s. Not this one, right here. Plan your family. And in this, in the middle panel, you'll see here, they... They ask, is, is this an abortion? And they confirm what we continue to say day after day, that abortion kills life after it has begun. This is Planned Parenthood. I mean, once in a while, truth eked out <laughs> of this organization, this eugenic organization. But it's amazing what happens when your business model changes. Because now they say abortion is health care. Abortion is moral. It is important. It is health care. These are some of their tweets. It's amazing what happens when you're a $2 billion organization that depends on your revenue from abortion. They say it's 3% of their services, yet it brings in 80 to 90% of their health services revenue. And of course, the other large chunk comes from us, taxpayer dollars, about 43%. So this is who Planned Parenthood is. And when, it, when we talk about fake health, it's amazing how medical associations still get on this fake health bandwagon. This is from the National Academies of Science. This is a study done on preterm births and what increases the risk of preterm births, which lead to birth defects like um, CP and, and other things, uh, and also increases infant mortality. And here, tucked away on page, what is it, 625 of this study, table B5, immutable medical risk factors associated with preterm birth, and the third one listed there. Can you read it for me? It's a good thing they tucked it back on page 625. Wouldn't want somebody to read that. Here's another study that was uh, issued by the National Cancer Institute, and they buried their own study from their own branch uh, chief, Dr. Louise Brinton. This is from a 2009 landmark study, and it talks here um, about the factors that lead to an increased risk of breast cancer, and of course it lists induced abortion. But you won't find that when you go to the National Cancer Institute's website because they say there are no studies that show that there's a correlation between abortion, induced abortion and breast cancer. So they ignore their own work. But yet you'll still have Planned Parenthood that will say on their website, there is no, there's no risk to future pregnancies. It doesn't increase infant mortality, it doesn't increase breast cancer, it doesn't increase any of these things that are actually confirmed in scientific study after scientific study. Fake health, fake feminism. And then they, they exploit maternal mortality because Planned Parenthood will exploit anything, no matter what. Their, their slogan is care no matter what, but they will exploit no matter what. They talk about maternal mortality. You're talking about 700 tragic deaths, but 700 tragic deaths a year in the United States, okay? The CDC and all these organizations and committees that study maternal mortality say the majority of these deaths are all preventable. And the one way that they talk about that it's, I mean, one of the ways it's not included as far as preventing or a solution to it is abortion. Only Planned Parenthood and pro-abortion sources say that. But these are, these are solvable issues. But I want to compare this, because they, you hear all the time from pro-abortion activists, well, pregnancy is a death sentence for women. I mean, look at the maternal mortality. You're talking about 700 versus a million abortions. Abortion does not reduce maternal mortality. In New York City, maternal mortality dropped 
I mean, just plummeted long before birth control was legalized, long before abortion was legalized. It plummeted, why? Because of better health care, because of penicillin. So here, just to give you a little comparison, 11,685 women die in car-related causes. 17 times more deaths than maternal deaths, but yet do you hear abortion activists say that women shouldn't be in cars, they shouldn't be drivers? Of course not. I mean, the way that you deal with preventable deaths is to implement those things like fighting obesity. That's one of the leading causes of maternal mortality. It has nothing to do with abortion. There are so many things about Planned Parenthood. We have these fact sheets at our table. There's a little display table in the back. Um, this helps you understand some of the fake health that they're pushing in our teens. I can't even say, you know if you can't even say some of the things, some of the school boards that are going over some of the curriculum that Planned Parenthood's in, trying to interject in these schools and the school board members can't even say some of the things, I won't even say some of the stuff, but you can read it on the fact sheet. And it's, this is a great fact sheet. It says 10, top 10 ways to keep Planned Parenthood out of your local school. Ah, oh, this is my favorite. <laughs> because, mm, let me just sum it up this way. And this is, this is a meme that got me in trouble with Instagram. They, they have threatened to suspend or revoke our accounts many times. We kill more black lives in two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century. Planned Parenthood, eugenics, no matter what. This is factual. And people don't even understand. They get so upset, I'm like, how dare you use a noose? How dare you ignore the deaths of, of innocent human lives? And how dare you ignore the connections of Planned Parenthood, whose board member was a grand, what is it called, a grand drag, wizard, a grand wizard? Lothrop Stoddard. I mean, there, are, there were many board members who were part of the KKK. Uh, Margaret Sanger had Nazi sympathizers who were writers in her periodical, the Birth Control Review. I mean, the ties, let me put it this way, the same vile racist pseudoscience that birthed the Holocaust birthed Planned Parenthood. Okay, so people need to understand that. But yet you'll have the new president of Planned Parenthood who said in um, the Wall Street Journal, she said she was defending Margaret Sanger and saying, look, the abortion industry, we're not the racist. Pro-life movement, yeah, they're the racist. Wait, wait a minute. The industry that kills for a living and disproportionately kills black lives up to rates five times higher, they're not the racist, but the ones who save human lives of the mothers, of the, of the children, regardless of hue of skin, we're the racists, but yet people are eating this up. This is why you can see tweets from Planned Parenthood that say things like this. If you're a black woman in America, it's statistically safer to have an abortion than to carry a pregnancy to term or to give birth. Yes. But see, let's just change the context. What if President Trump tweeted that? <laughs> Do you think there would have been a different public reaction? But because Planned Parenthood tweets it, Nothing. They can say these kinds of things. I love, this is, mm, there's so much, I'm gonna have to skip some of these things, but Fannie Lou Hamer was, you know, a voting rights activist and anti-poverty activist. She had no love for Planned Parenthood. And I love this quote um, from her, her speech. It's called, America is sick and man is on the critical list. She says, I'll tell you the next thing I don't buy. I don't buy distributing birth control pills and legalizing abortion because they're talking about us. If you want to abortionize somebody, do it to yourself, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to keep the children. And yet Planned Parenthood constantly quotes Fannie Lou Hamer and uses her to promote abortion in the black community. She was a pro-life mama who was an adoptive mama who railed against Planned Parenthood and called abortion genocide in the black community. There's so much to, talk, to, to touch on. I'm gonna get to the last one. I'm gonna skip over some of these. So I love when Planned Parenthood gets religious, okay? This, I think I have like maybe two minutes. It's hard to get to some of this. Let me just play this last clip. This is from the DC area where they were having a blessing ceremony for the new Planned Parenthood. Oh, by the way, this is their 40 days of prayer. Planned Parenthood's 40 days of prayer. I love it. Religious leaders bless Planned Parenthood Health Center and its mission. Let me just play this clip from you. This is the celebration. I'm going to 
your heart. I want to see that, uh, Sammy, do we have the audio for that last slide? Here's my little girl, my 10-year-old. Let's, let's rewind this for just a second. By the way, when I talk about the my birth mom's courageous decision and beautiful reverberations for generations, these are the most beautiful ones, my whole family. My youngest, Aaliyah, my, my oldest, Ray Ray, my, my wife, my favorite woman on the planet, and my son, Makai, and my son, Justice. Two of my kiddos are adopted. Out of the four, three were unplanned. All four are loved like crazy. And so I just want to redeem the song that was actually the anthem, Fannie Lou Hamer's anthem, This Little Light of Mine. I just kind of want to redeem it. My, my 10-year-old who just just started singing publicly about a year ago. She just comes up with her own harmonies. I just hit record, and I love seeing the gifts and talents come from all my children. But um, I think she redeems that song a little bit. Could we play that audio again? Thank you. There's a few minutes of Q&A or not Q&A. We have five minutes for Q&A, and Brian is staying for lunch, and they are going to have the exhibit table up, so um, there's time to purchase his books and everything as well. So a couple of questions. We got one up front here. Do you need a microphone? or? Let's go ahead and use a microphone. Okay. Question, question and a comment. Um, can you speak to the effort, I remember not too long ago, of efforts to defund Planned Parenthood, possibly through this administration? And secondly, um, I helped organize an Orphan Sunday um, as part of the Christian Alliance for Orphans mm -hmm. uh, recently, and the Metafins go to this church. I'm just curious if you're connected with that I group. love Jed. Okay. Uh, known Jed for years. I uh, love the Christian Alliance for Orphans, CAFO.org, C-A-F-O.org. Really check it out. It's a great alliance of adoption agencies, adoption organizations. As far as defunding Planned Parenthood, <sighs> Republican Congress, at least for several years, and Republican in the executive branch, and yet Planned Parenthood increased their funding. Yep. Uh, in the last year. Now, now there's a Title X reduction, $60 million, that I guess will be reflected next year. The problem is there are lots of states and, and local city councils that are actually funding Planned Parenthood, that are, and that's why they're getting more and more money. So it's not just on the federal level. It's on the local level. It's on the state level. So yes, President Trump has done an amazing... Actually, I'm just shocked. I mean, the amount of pro-life achievements that he has... that that he is, it needs to be credited with, not to mention he's actually the first president to march in the March of Life of any president in U.S. history. But there's a lot of efforts that, 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 that need to, and we have to keep pressure on our federal legislators, our state legislators, and we need to find out where money is going from our city councils, and sometimes county councils. That we have to understand. Oh, it came close, but I'm just saying, okay, I'm just going to say this. I wish Republicans would act like Democrats because Democrats get things done. Yeah. The problem is when you have Republicans in control and they could have, should have, but didn't, I know there are a lot of procedural things, but it, it frustrates me to no end. Um, but 
the effort was there. That was the great. effort was there, and there were some who, who put forth an incredible amount of effort, but um, they, some could have tried a little harder. Okay, we've got another question over here. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm so grateful for you. Um, I, I, I'm going into my book club tonight. Uh, I'm the only pro-life person of the women there maybe not the only Christian. The argument, one thing I've read about this statistic, 100 gender side, 160 million missing women, the imbalance. Um, I spoke with the one of the earlier speakers. He said it might be as high as 400 million missing women in the world. And my question for the feminists that I'm going to see is, are you racist because they're brown-skinned and yellow-skinned women in, in uh, China and India? Or are you really not feminist? You're just abortionists. How would Planned Parenthood answer that? Are they really not feminist? Do they ignore the gender side? Yes. Or just say it's not there? Yes, they ignore the gender side. Yes, they actually enable the gender side, particularly with their association, uh, Planned Parenthood Global, that works with um, China Family Planning Association that has killed hundreds and hundreds of millions. I mean, gender side is made possible by a lot of these organizations, whether it's Marie Stopes International, Planned Parenthood. So they would call themselves feminists, by the way, but people can call themselves all kinds of things. I mean, you have Rachel Dolezal, who is white, calling herself African-American. I mean, people call themselves <laughs> different things all the time. It doesn't make it true. So <laughs> we have to call out fake feminists um, on this, the fact that they are virtually silent on the forced abortion issue, and of course, silent about the violence of abortion in general. Okay. Hello, I'm Cheney Mullins from Plan the Pregnancy and Life Assistance Network. Okay. I just was wondering if you could elaborate. You talked a bit about um, the birth control agenda of Margaret Sanger, and I've read that Planned Parenthood didn't actually start doing abortions until a couple years after her death. Do you see these issues as linked at all as potentially birth control having some kind of eugenic origin or problem when we're looking at pro-life issues? 100% is linked. I mean, birth control was, I mean, you, you saw the quote from Women in the New Race. I mean, you can take her at her word. <laughs> she talked about it being a way to reduce the number of defectives. The, um, the, the founder of the American Eugenic Society, um, Dr. Frederick, not Dr., but Frederick Osborne, um, said that um, birth control, if I get the quote right, birth control and a, abortion are turning out to be the greatest eugenic advances of our time. He acknowledged the fact that they are one and the same, that their goal is the same. It was the elimination of those considered unfit. And so people say, well, it's today, it's different. And they'll also say, well, Planned Parenthood's not the same Planned Parenthood as it was during Margaret Sanger's time. Actually, during Margaret Sanger's time, Planned Parenthood was better in a sense, because they weren't killing hundreds of thousands of human beings a year. Planned Parenthood is worse now, but their DNA is still intact. They still have that racist, elitist DNA in everything that they do. Uh, hi. Okay. Final oh. question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is actually more of a comment. Um, I'm, my name's Ashley. I'm from Chapel Hill, um, Durham area in North Carolina. Um, I just wanted to know, I'm glad that you brought up the um, the organizations that provide funding that we don't know about, um, that kind of do it secretly. Um, please, um, I'm sure a lot of you have either daughters or granddaughters that are in Girl Scouts. Um, I want you, like, they are one of those organizations. They are put up by WAGS, and WAGS gives a lot of money to uh, mostly propaganda, but also just, um, ev also, services that um, promote abortion, promote a lot of sexual deviancy. So um, it, those of you who have daughters and granddaughters in those organizations, start talking about it, start getting yourself informed and um, bring that up to the, your, your loved ones. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. We have an article about the Girl Scouts on our website. You go to Radiance.life, just type in Girl Scouts, and you'll see all the direct links about the shocking things that WAG supports. In addition to abortion, they support um, decriminalizing prostitution or legalizing prostitution. That's exactly what Girl Scouts should be working, working toward, right? So thank you so much. All right. All right. All right. Wonderful job. Wonderful job.